Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this afternoon uh, NEA Advanced Energy Efficient Seminar. Uh, I'm Wilson, your MC for the day. Uh, for those uh, participants who have attended the earlier seminar, we welcome you back again. Before we start, as usual, please uh, turn your handphone to silent mode. Thank you. For this afternoon's seminar, uh, we are honored to have invited Mr. Amir Lovings, the um, co-founder, chairman, and uh, chief scientist of the uh, IMI, the Rocky Mountain Institute. The IMI is a leading institute in uh, energy efficiency and uh, NGO in the uh, USA. The IMI shows a uh, business how to do, uh, how to create competitive advantages and uh, increase profit by doing what they do far more efficiently. Typically, with uh, expanding returns to investment, Mr. Lovings uh, has advised industry in more than 50 countries for more than four decades. His client includes companies such as Shell, BP, Texas Instrument, HP, etc. He has experience in more than uh, 30 million US worth of uh, new and uh, retrofitting projects worldwide in 29 sectors. The Wall Street Journal uh, named him among the 39 people in the world most likely to change the course of business in the 90s. And the Newsweek magazine called him one of the Western world most uh, influential energy thinkers. He has also been recognized by Times Magazine as a hero of the environment as well as a hero of the planet. And this afternoon, we are honored uh, to have Mr. Loving to share with us his presentation on uh, advanced energy efficiency for process industry and semicolon manufacturing. Mr. Living, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for this opportunity to share some recent uh, ideas and experience on how to make much bigger and cheaper energy savings than you might have thought possible. Let me just ask how many of you, if any, were at the building seminar this morning Okay, and the, and the data center seminar. <clears throat> Let me ask your indulgence if you hear a little of the same material again. There's some overlap, but maybe it makes more sense the third time. <clears throat> uh, climate protection is quite profitable, <clears throat> even if you don't think it's necessary, because saving energy is cheaper than buying energy. So two of our biggest... Uh, Chip-making firms have been routinely cutting their carbon emissions 6% a year with two- or three-year paybacks by fixing their existing plants. DuPont set a goal that by 2010, with 6% gains in annual energy productivity and some shift to renewables, they would cut greenhouse gas emissions to 65% below the 1990 level. Actually, by 2006, they were 80% below the 1990 level, and they made $3 billion U.S. profit by substituting efficiency for fuel. Dow Chemical did even better than that. BP met its operational carbon reduction goals eight years early. Yet they bashfully said no net costs, so I uh, inquired, and they bashfully admitted that they had actually made $1.6 billion U.S. dollars profit on that deal. General Electric is in the process of raising its energy productivity 30% to build shareholder value. Interface built the most oil-resistant cost structure in the carpet industry, cutting its total greenhouse gas emissions by five-eighths. In fact, in the, in the uh, carpet business alone by four-fifths uh, while growing the business very profitably. Texas Instruments... Uh, recently commissioned a new chip fed building in Texas using a fifth less energy than their previous design without using the two biggest energy saving recommendations, which would have taken that around 50%. Those were still being tested at the time. And they also saved a third of the water and 30% of the capex. And it's because it was 230 million U.S. dollars cheaper than expected to build that they were able to build it in Texas, not China. So the politicians keep debating the theoretical costs of climate protection, but smart companies are racing to pocket the profits before their competitors do. This uh, opportunity has been underscored by recent work by McKinsey & Company, the world management consultants, 
looking at how much you save or pay in euros to save a ton of carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gas emissions in the world in 2030. And because this area of profitable measures, mainly efficiency, roughly equals this area of stuff you have to pay for, they figured they could get a 46% reduction in those emissions at an average cost of two euros a ton, which is indistinguishable from zero. And actually, uh, it's a very conservative assessment. Now, each company has its own piece of that opportunity. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Uh, Lee Englock, sitting here, uh, and his team have told me of some interesting cases they've worked on. One was a back-end fab in the region in 97, mainly by fixing the mechanicals. Uh, they were able to cut the energy use per chip by 69% in 11 months with a 14-month payback and uh, then went on from there. The uh, excellent efficiency of the Ang uh fab in Singapore, the front end from ST Micro, uh, started off with under a year payback with a few years effort and then uh, altogether if you count 91 through 97, uh, they saved 30 million US dollars and the energy intensity per standard wafer went down 60%, which provided 80% of the energy capacity for a three and a half fold increase in output. Uh, and 80% of the measures paid back within a year and a half. Uh, what most impressed me is that those, those retrofits were done during continuous operation with over 20 each of cryogenic freeze plugs and hot taps. Most impressive. Now, what this was doing nonetheless, despite the size of the numbers, is just harvesting low-hanging fruit that's fallen down and is mushing up around the ankles and spilling in over the tops of our boots. Meanwhile, the innovation tree keeps dropping more fruit on our head. Uh, of course, none of this would have been possible if the fabs had been optimally designed in the first place. But like most factories, they were designed with infectious repetitis. That is, we copy the previous set of drawings because we know it worked. And the copy exactly mentality of, say, Intel is uh, understandable in the manufacturing process, which is so delicate and there's so much that can go wrong and one must always verify the witchcraft that makes it work. But it really doesn't make sense in the utility side where you're just producing something like chilled water or clean air and where we want continuous improvement, the very opposite of copy exactly. I actually was once in a, a fab where a certain pipe overhead made a right angle bend around an invisible obstacle. I asked what that was about and they said they'd been told to copy exactly the piping diagram from the previous plant where there was a structural pillar in that location I never found out what happened to the pillar. <clears throat> um, or here's a, a very simple example of retrofitting a, a large petrochemical complex. Uh, <clears throat> they were making, forgive the barbaric units, 1300 PSI steam, uh, but not cogenerating with it. Well, either they should cogenerate it with it or they shouldn't make it because what they were doing with it was just throttling it back. Uh, and <clears throat> also there were pressure letdowns uh, elsewhere in the system that could cogenerate over 10 megawatts with a present value of 45 million US dollars. A boiler could be replaced with another carbon monoxide burner. General Motors had offered to give a free high temperature fuel cell for testing and this would burn all the hydrocarbons very nicely. They vented a lot of steam but of course even the 50 pound steam was good for absorption chilling which would save condensate and it would save a three to one ratio of 130 pound steam. Uh, there was a strong opportunity for innovation and optimization and control in the furnaces. The high temperature heat that they were throwing away, paying to throw away, could be used to distill water for better water chemistry in the boilers and for the cooling towers and fin fans. Um, they could distribute and optimize their distillation, integrate with some nearby facilities they owned or owned by others. <clears throat> they could compress air only to the pressures actually required without letting it down, and they had a good shot at actually eliminating compressed air, which is generally a good way to start. 
Um, they could much improve their sensors and the graphical presentation of their data so the operators would be able to work better. And they could use high efficiency cooling towers, do some overcooling, maybe summer sink with well water. And this, this may sound terribly conventional, but it added up to extremely large and profitable saving opportunities. In fact, some of the biggest things you can do on retrofit in any process plant are the simplest, like turning off things you're not using, very seldom done, or running existing cooling towers properly. They all ought to be run all the time at variable speed, so you have big slow fans, not small fast fans, and you're using the maximum face area available. Free cooling. I have yet to find a chip fab anywhere in the world that was actually designed for its climate. Uh, <clears throat> at a, one of ST's fabs, it cost 80% less to run free cooling uh, than to run the chillers. As I recall, this was Waterside Economizer, saving uh, 4 megawatts during more than 100 days a year and a 1 to 3 year payback. So it's actually worth, in a temperate climate at least, having variable speed drive on all the chillers to exploit seasonal differences in uh, wet bulb depression. But the point about being designed for climate is, is sharpens when we think of another fab we went to, which was uh, in the French Alps. And they'd had a lot of geotechnical problems building the plant because there was this river of icy glacial meltwater running under the site, and they'd needed to put in a lot of very expensive pilings and so on to get down to competent bearing rock. They still put in all the chillers. It never occurred to them to use this as a heat sink. Uh, and um, another very common retrofit is that if you have primary secondary pumping, which is typically a sign of excessive pipe friction, then uh, if you turn off the secondary pumping, you tend to feel better immediately. Uh, in fact... We had a mining operation we looked at where uh, they were storing a lot of inadvertently produced water that was a byproduct of the mine and had built up over the years berms higher and higher. And as the pressure heads changed, they started getting water hammer and all sorts of Baroque hydraulic problems that were quite expensive to solve. And one day a new engineer arrived, looked at this arrangement and said, you know, chaps, we're pumping water downhill, and they were. Uh, it took two years for him to fail to persuade his colleagues this is what they were doing. So one day he simply went out and turned off the pumps and opened the valves and felt instant relief. <laughs> now, <clears throat> if you, if you uh, go more conventionally, and just look at the measured cost and performance of about a 1,000 technologies for saving electricity, as my team did in the late 80s, you find that if they're fully installed in, say, the United States in 1986, they would have saved three-quarters of total electricity use in all sectors at an average cost that in today's dollars is about one U.S. cent per kilowatt hour. That's uh, cheaper than running a thermal plant, even if building it and delivering the power cost nothing. There were similar results that came in from very detailed studies in other more efficient countries. The utilities think tank found you could not save 75%, but only 40 to 60%, and instead of one cent, it would cost three or four cents a kilowatt hour. Still very big and cheap, and the difference was actually methodological, not substantive. But the savings keep getting bigger and cheaper faster than we use them up. Uh, so efficiency is a bigger, cheaper resource. And it's not just because of better technology, it's because of better integrated design. So asking your forgiveness if you've seen this example already. Um, I keep coming back to my house for some reason. Uh, it's in the Rocky Mountains at 2,200 meters. It can go to minus 44 Celsius there occasionally. You can get frost any day of the year. By the way, minus 40 is the freezing point of mercury. Uh, you can get 39 days of continuous midwinter clouds, so we say we have two seasons, winter and July. But if you come in to the atrium in the middle, out of the snowstorm, there's the banana jungle inside, and I've harvested already 28 banana crops. My newest big banana tree is growing two centimeters a day. And then you realize there's no heating system, because I didn't need one, and it was cheaper up front not to put one in, in this 4,900 Celsius degree day climate. It sounds a little odd because mostly you would, 
you know, you would expect to ask an engineer, how much insulation should I use in such a cold place? And probably the engineer would say, well, just as much as will pay for itself over the years from the saved heating fuel. This is what all the textbooks say. But it's wrong, methodologically, because it leaves out the capex of the heating system. It assumes the heating system will be there anyway and it will be the same size or maybe just incrementally smaller. But actually, if we use two or three times normal thermal insulation and windows that insulate like 14 sheets of glass, which we have, but they look like two and cost less than three, and six air-to-air -air heat exchangers for ventilation heat recovery, and a few other things, the building is 1100 US dollars cheaper to build because that equipment costs less extra than we saved up front by not putting in the heating system. So I ended up reinvesting that money plus some more, totaling 16 US dollars per square meter, to save also 99% of the water heating energy, 90% of the household electricity, which would cost seven or eight sing dollars a month if I didn't make it with solar, and half the water, and it all paid back in 10 months with 1983 technology. 25 years later, we can do much better. If I were doing it now, I'd save another two-thirds of the electricity remaining, and it would cost even less to build. Here's a house with the obligatory stupid dark roof and a big garage saying cars live here. You can tell this is an American house. And uh, it's comfortable without air conditioning at plus 46, although not with Singapore humidity. And if built uh, generally not as a one-off, it would be cheaper than normal to build and to maintain, but it uses 82% less energy as designed than allowed by the then strictest standard in the U.S. and about 90% less than a normal U.S. house. Now, Professor Sunton Bunyatakarn, who teaches architecture at Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, came to visit my house and said, well, of course, you're at a cold, dry place, I'm at a hot, wet place, but now I understand your design integration method, I'll bet I can do the same in Bangkok. And he did, with this nice 350 square meter square house of his own, built 12 years ago, and using a tenth of normal aircon energy to produce superior comfort at no extra construction cost. Deep overhangs, super windows, natural ventilation, and so on. Now, these three houses span the range of the Earth's climates, and they all show the same story, that if you optimize the house as a system, not the components by themselves, you, have, you get big savings cheaper than small ones. Contrary to economic theory, which assumes diminishing returns, so the more you save, the more and more steeply the marginal cost goes up until it becomes too expensive and you have to stop. There is, by the way, no theoretical requirement in economics that this be true, it's simply a convenient assumption they make because otherwise their models blow up. That's bad. Um, now, diminishing returns don't even turn out to be true for all components. They're not true for motors, for example. If you look at the database of all motors on the North American market and you look at the commonest industrial type, up to at least 220 kilowatts, there's actually no correlation between price and efficiency. And if I buy this very efficient motor instead of this very inefficient motor, I save capex as well as over 20,000 US dollars of present valued opex. Whereas if I assumed that an efficient motor must cost too much and I buy a cheap motor, but not the right cheap motor, maybe I buy this one, I waste a whole lot of money. And I could even be wasting capex. In the Swedish industrial pump market, I can get five or six and sometimes eight percentage points extra for free by shopping carefully, no extra cost. So our motto is, in God we trust, all others bring data, because quite often efficient kit doesn't cost more if you shop for it carefully. So don't make any assumptions, please, from economic theory. But here's another example about motors. Um, there was a partial motor survey we did by looking at the nameplates in a typical mid-aged fab. It was about 15 years old at the time. And the red X's showed the nameplate ratings for 75 representative pump and fan motors totaling two, two and a half megawatts, except that 
uh, actually, um, this was 14 motors. This point was 37 motors, only 80% efficient at 40 horsepower. Ugh. And uh, 10 of the motors we had either no or illegible nameplates, so we don't know what they were. Now, it turned out that if you compare those red X's to the white points, which represent all the motors on the market in 1996, uh, meeting those requirements, we were an average 6.8 percentage points short below the best. And altogether, if you assume 90% duty factor and 5 U.S. cent tariff, the 20-year present value of that shortfall was 1.4 million U.S. dollars uh, for all of the motors we looked at, which were only a third of the motors in the plant by, by capacity. So it looks like that plant was probably leaving about four or five million U.S. dollars present value on the table by not buying the best in class. Uh, or if you're in the petrochemical or refining business, you might like to look at the blue stars. Uh, that's what was the minimum energy performance, full load efficiency, required by a very large oil company we work with. And that's for explosion proof, which is inherently 0.4 to 1.6 percentage point below the total enclosed fan cools motors shown here. But you can see that it doesn't actually approach uh, the best explosion proof motors, which are the little red dots, until you get up to the very largest sizes. So even then, their standard was leaving a great deal on the table, and especially for the largest motors that use the most electricity. Back to this curve, of course, insulation does follow diminishing returns. That's a matter of engineering physics. But if in my house I put in so much insulation, more than you would normally consider cost-effective, that I no longer need the furnace, ducts, fans, pipes, pumps, wires, controls, and fuel supply, I end up saving 99% of my heating energy cheaper than if I tried to save little or nothing. And why should I get to that destination the long way around when I can tunnel straight through the cost barrier to that destination? Well, there are two ways to do that, which I'll detail in a minute, but let me first just explain that it's real. We've now demonstrated this in over 30 billion US dollars worth of facilities starting with retrofit designs for eight chip fabs, saving often upwards of half the energy used to make chilled water and clean air, paybacks averaging about two years. We took the most efficient oil refinery in Europe and were able to find 42% savings with a three-year average payback, 50% savings in getting the rest from things they're throwing away at a North Sea oil platform, over 40% savings with few-year paybacks at the world's second biggest LNG plant, even bigger savings with new trains, um, big savings in a big platinum mine, world's biggest, or a billion-dollar capex saving and 62% energy savings at a fischer tropsch uh, GTL plant. Now, our next new chip fab design after the Texas Instruments one I mentioned eliminated all 22,000 tons of chillers and should save about two-thirds of the electricity and half the capex. Our next new, or our, our original data center designs uh, were saving about 89% of the energy with somewhat lower capex and better uptime. The latest one we've done uh, is 80% savings before the software improvements, which will be a lot more, and uh, saving about half the capex if they indeed they have the guts not to build the chillers they won't need, which is all of them. Otherwise, it only saves 20% of the capex, and the uptime should be better by an order of magnitude. We recently designed a mine for an equatorial country that is powered by gravity, no fossil fuel. Supermarkets, huge savings, chemical plant, another kind of chemical plant. Altogether, on retrofits, we normally save about 30 to 60% of the energy with two or three year paybacks. If it's a new facility, the savings are more like 40 to 90% but CapEx in almost every case goes down. So we've now tunneled through the cost barrier in altogether 29 sectors. Of course, if the, if the plants had been properly designed in the first instance, we couldn't have done any of this. So 
we're hatching a plot for the nonviolent overthrow of bad engineering involving a casebook of very high brain velcro examples uh, in, set in facing columns with the normal way to do it and uh, reinforced by demand pull in which the heads of large firms that buy a lot of engines, engineering services will ring up their favorite deans of engineering and say, you know, we've just tested this new casebook in our practice and uh, we can't hire your graduates unless you teach them this way because they won't be able to produce the breakthrough results that our competitive success requires. That will tend to change the pedagogy faster than waiting for the old profs to die or retire, which is the normal time constant. Now back to tunneling through the cost barrier, there are two broad ways to do it. The simpler way is to get multiple benefits from single expenditures. In the building seminar this morning, I mentioned 10 benefits from super windows. We don't normally count nine of those. There are 18 benefits each from efficient premium motors and from dimmable lighting ballasts, not just one. The arch that holds up the middle of my house actually has 12 different functions, but I only pay for it once. It's really fun to design this way. Hardly any component in my house has fewer than three functions. That's a pretty good indication that you're on the right track. There's another way to tunnel through the cost barrier, and that's to take advantage of renovations you're doing anyway for another reason. For example, facade renewal, which was needed for a 20-year-old all glass and no windows office tower near Chicago, where it's both hot and humid in the summer and cold in the winter. And because it was 20 years old, the edge seals around the glazing units were failing. You have to reglaze the whole thing. And normally you would replace with like. And what was already there was dark double bronze glass plus a gray film, which let in altogether only 9% of the visible light. It was as gloomy as a cave. But we found that even in the early 90s, we could replace this with super windows that would be about perfect in letting in light without heat. They let in nearly six times more visible light, but 10% less unwanted heat. And they'd cut the flow of, loss, uh, the ho flow of uh, heat and noise by three or fourfold and have a slight extra cost. But then we could bounce the daylight now let in through the windows, unlike your dark heat absorbing glass, all the way through the floor plate without glare and use very efficient lights and plug loads and altogether at the design hour the peak cooling load would go down by three quarters which means that the big old cooling system that had to be renovated for age and CFCs could be replaced with a new one four times smaller almost four times more efficient and about two hundred thousand US dollars cheaper than the big old one uh, renovation and that money would be enough to pay for the extra cost of the super windows, the lighting retrofit, the daylighting retrofit. So you'd end up saving three quarters of the energy with a minus five month payback. In other words, slightly cheaper than the regular 20 year renovation that saves nothing. The United States has over 100,000 over 20 year old curtain wall office buildings awaiting this treatment. I dare say you might have a few. Now, I want to rearrange your metal furniture a little by using an example in the spirit of my mentor Edwin Land's remark, the inventor of instant photography, who said the people who seem to have had a new idea have often just stopped having an old idea. He also said invention is just a sudden cessation of stupidity and a uh, failure is any circumstance not yet fully turned to your advantage. Well, for 30 odd years, experts on creative thinking have been teaching this example, find the solution that connects these nine dots with just four lines without lifting your pen from the paper. So you think one, two, three, four, hmm, five, that doesn't work. Or maybe diagonally, one, two, uh, that isn't going to work. And to solve this problem in just four lines, you have to think outside the box, which is where that expression comes from. Well, it turns out there's even a good three line solution if your paper is wide enough, you don't have to go through the middle of the dots. And seeing this, the students felt liberated enough to come up with a lot of great one-line solutions. For example, the origami method: fold up the paper till all the lines come together, or all the points to come together in a line. Or 
the geographer's solution, a very long line, or the mechanical engineer's solution of cutting out the dots with a tool called a scissors, or the statistician's solution, I'm going to crumple up the paper, and if I stab it enough times with a pencil, eventually I'll go through all nine dots at the same instant. Or the one I like best from a nine-year-old girl who said, you didn't say it had to be a thin line, so I used a thick line. So the original design assignment here was misstated. Find the solution with four lines. And this tyranny of the word the, as if there were only one way to do it, put us back in the box so we couldn't be properly creative in finding the more elegantly frugal solutions. Well, one of my favorite examples <coughs> is a runaround pumping loop. It could perfectly well have been a chilled water or a condenser water loop, but this was for heat transfer in a factory. And the top German firm optimized it to use 71 kilowatts. And then with some ideas from Mr. Lee, we took it to a Dutch engineer who designed it at 5.3 kilowatts, 92% less. And it cost less to build. It worked better because of two changes in design mentality. The first was to use big pipes and small pumps rather than small pipes and big pumps. The friction in a pipe goes down, you know, is nearly the fifth power of its diameter. And the engineering textbooks tell us to make the pipe just as fat as will repay its greater capex over the years from the safe pumping energy. But this is methodologically just as wrong as not counting the ability to eliminate the furnace in my house when you think about how much insulation there should be. Because after all, the pumps, the motors, the inverters, the electricals all have to be big enough to overcome the friction in this piping system so their size and roughly their capex will go down as nearly the fifth power of pipe diameter. But the fatter pipe costs more as only about the second power of diameter. So when we conventionally optimize the pipe as a component by itself, we're pessimizing the system. If we optimize the whole thing together, we'll use fat pipes, tiny pumps and motors, and the total capex will go down. Not rocket science, just good... Victorian engineering rediscovered. Another lesson we learned from Mr. Lee is to lay out the pipes first, then the equipment. Normally, of course, we do it the other way around. We put the equipment where we're used to, and then we call in the pipe fitters to hook it up. But by then, of course, there's so much in between, and it's so far apart, and they're all at the wrong height, facing the wrong way, that by the, pipe, by the time the pipe gets all the way across dressed at neat right angles, it has three to six times the friction that it should have had with a short straight shot. The pipe fitters think this is great. You pay them by the hour. They mark up the pipes and fittings with extra profit. They're not paying for your bigger pumping equipment or electric bill. But for you as owner, it's better to have fat short straight pipes than thin long crooked pipes. And in this case, factor 12 reduction in pumping energy, less capex, and as a free bonus, 70 kilowatts less heat loss because it's easier to insulate short straight pipes. But I'm afraid we botched the job by not counting seven additional benefits. The system will now be smaller, lighter, quieter, have a cleaner layout for easy maintenance access, need less maintenance because there's less to go wrong, have higher uptime, and last longer because there aren't so many elbows being eroded away over time by fluid turning a corner. I did a rough calc that we would have saved another factor four if we'd counted those benefits as well, and it would have cost even less. The more benefits you count, the better solution you get. And this case is archetypical because practically everything we've got in our society that uses energy, including especially process plants, tends to be designed optimizing single components for single benefits rather than whole systems for multiple benefits. And if we get that right, we typically save half to one order of magnitude on energy and water and other resources, typically with lower capex and better performance. Hence the need for the casebook of vivid examples of this sort. And if any of you are or know of practitioners who have such good examples, of factor four or 10 energy savings with lower capex through whole system design, please let me know. I'd like to feature those in our casebook. 
Now, the reason to focus a minute on pumping examples is not just they're predominant in process plants, they're predominant everywhere. Pumping is the world's biggest use of motors. Fans, which have the same physics, are the second biggest. Together, fans and pumps use half the motor electricity, and motors use three-fifths of all electricity, even more in Singapore. A big motor running all the time uses its capex worth of electricity every few weeks. And there are 35 things you can do to motor systems to save about half their electricity very cheaply because if you buy the right seven things first, you get 28 more savings for free. But before you attack the motor system, you should start further downstream in, in the torque requirement and further downstream than that in, for the case of a pumping system, flow and friction. Now, that's, of course, one thing to do for a big plant where there are obvious opportunities of many kinds but let me just feature the pumping systems out of this larger list. <clears throat> Since electricity is the costliest form of energy and the most lucrative kind to save. Um, if we start with eliminating a flow requirement, maybe we didn't need the flow at all. Maybe if we design the building properly, it won't need so much cooling. And the Japanese uh, lean thinking term muda meaning purposelessness, waste, and futility, comes in many, many forms. Uh, that's another conversation. But we find generally a good heuristic for designing for efficiency is to ask, why are we doing this task in the first place? Can we get rid of it? And then to look at demand before supply, downstream before upstream, the application before the equipment, the people before the hardware, passive before active solutions, and quality before quantity. Let me just do a quick exercise with you on eliminating Muda. Have any of you been in a carpet industry dye house? Well, I hadn't either, but I came into one and stood in the doorway and looked around for a while. Here's what I saw. Once in a while, a big spool of white nylon would come in from DuPont on the loading dock, and they'd bring it in and unwrap it. And then they would un uncoil it into loose skeins so the water could get added, and they'd wash it in some hot soapy water and then rinse it and then dry it in a once through gas oven. Then it was ready to dye, so they'd put it in a vat of aqueous circulating dye, and then they would run it through the oven again to dry it, and then they would re-spool it and then send it down the road to the tufting factory. So you have the process flow in mind. Where's the muda? Were there unnecessary steps in there? Again, unspool, wash, rinse, dry, dye, dry, re-spool, and ship. What of that can you get rid of? There's something wrong with my hearing. Please don't be bashful. What? Interesting. Um, what's another way of thinking about this? You're washing it, rinsing it, drying it, and then putting it back in something wet. Why are we drying it twice? Right? I think that's you're, you're asking the same in another way. Sure, that's a very good place to spot Muda. What's the most basic question about this that occurs to you? What? Why do you have to dye it? Well, sure. Could you... Uh, for example, <coughs> make it in such a way that depending on how you twist it, different colors show. Or if you treat it with some kind of special light or microwave, certain colors come out or something like that. Or, of course, there are locational questions. Why are you doing this in a different place than it's made or a different place that it's used? Is that an unnecessary transport? Wait a minute, there's something really big here. There's the, there's the elephant in the room. Nobody's quite got to yet. Why are we washing it? This is the first thing I ask. What's happening? Is it getting dirty in the road shipment? Is it not wrapped properly? Surely it was clean when it left the factory. 
And they said, oh, no, no, we wash it because it comes equipped with this sizing powder that's really meant for other industries, but we don't like it because it gums up our carpet-making equipment, so we have to wash it out again. To which the obvious question is, well, have you asked DuPont if they could ship it without the sizing powder? And the answer is, oh, yes, we'd be happy to do that, and we'll charge you less. And when you do that, about two-thirds to three-quarters of the space, energy, water, and wastewater in this plant go away. But for 30 years, they hadn't asked that question because it was the way they'd always done it. You see this stuff all the time. Now, <clears throat> more broadly, if you want breakthrough industrial energy efficiency, you really have to start with business vision, model, strategy, and culture, and then eliminate the task and then those things. And when you do that, this approach lets you capture multiple benefits and make them compound or multiply, free up the most capacity for production, avoid the most capex, eliminate the most waste and the most harm, make the most profit, do the most good, have the most fun. Okay, let me give you a fun example. Um, <clears throat> Safeway is a large supermarket chain. They were making ice cream uh, for their own use under their own brand. And what they would do, of course, was... Uh, the normal food industry thing of <clears throat> make a batch of, uh, of uh, chocolate caramel ice cream and then shut down and clean in place with high-pressure turbulent water and then make a batch of mint vanilla or whatever and then shut down and clean in place and then make the, the next batch and so on. Well, the poor chap in charge of environmental affairs had to figure out how to deal with all the cleaning wastes, which were full of rather expensive... Uh, fats and flavorings that had now been turned into waste. He had to do something with them, and fats are quite hard to dispose of. So he said, look, why don't we not do most of this cleaning in place and just run continuously with our batches back to back and keep track of the zone where there are mixed flavors and keep it in a special vat and then package it as magical mystery tour ice cream uh, you know, it's a bit of this and a bit of that, and we, do, we, you know, you can never tell exactly what it's going to be. It'll be an interesting voyage of discovery, but it'll really taste good. And they tried selling it uh, at a discount. Well, there was so much demand for it, they found they could sell it at a premium. <laughs> and think about what this does for your economics. Uh, what it saves you is the raw materials you were wasting, the cost of disposing of the cleaning wastes, and the reagents and so on, the lost time and production capacity of having to clean when you could have been producing, and in addition, you get a premium price and you do cannibalize some of your own products, but you hope you cannibalize your competitors more because they don't have this. <laughs> and uh, you can imagine what a sort of economic winner this is when you design out the waste and make it into value. But in order to figure this out, you have to think of the opposite, in the opposite direction to the process flow. Normally we think of a process that makes resources turn into products and wastes. Actually, these arrows are disproportionate the wrong way because in, for example, the U.S. economy, only 7% of the input resources that we extract from nature actually ends up in a product at all, and six-sevenths of those don't get into durables. So only 1% of the throughput ends up in durable products, and then when we're done with them, they're 98% thrown away and only 2% recycled, reused, and remanufactured. So that system is 99% pure muda, which is a wonderful business opportunity. But we're used to thinking in the way that the stuff flows, but our thinking has to be the other way, from downstream to upstream. And then... We save the most capex and the most opex, reduce the most waste, and turn the most waste into value. By designing to optimize the whole system, not the parts. And Mr. Lee has a nice culinary expression in the Singapore tradition of how to do this. Since our Chinese cuisine is famous for using everything and wasting nothing, why don't we do our engineering that way? So if I feed 100 units of fuel into a classical power plant and lose most of it at the plant and more in the grid and more along the way, 
I only get a tenth that much energy coming out the pipe as flow. Every unit of flow or friction I can save in the pipe will save ten times that much fuel cost pollution and global warming back at the power plant. And it will make the motor, for example, two and a half units smaller. So as I go back upstream, I compound the savings in energy and in capex, making the equipment smaller, simpler, and cheaper. I don't know any engineering text that tells us to start downstream, but it's a very fundamental way to multiply your savings. So if we think about flow, let's first try to get rid of the flow that's causing us to do the pumping. I was working in a big LNG plant where they're trying to make minus 161 initially Celsius liquid methane in a blazing desert. And I was walking around with my weapon of choice, which is an infrared thermometer pointed at the ground rather to the puzzlement of my hosts until I pointed out that the ground was covered with several hectares of dark uh, asphalt and gray concrete up below the cryo plumbing that they're trying to make extremely cold. What's wrong with this picture? So then we did some regressions on how the plant works in different weathers and we found that each Celsius degree by which we could cool off the site by putting something light colored and cheap on the ground would save 106 million Aussie dollars present value and altogether there was about one or two billion dollars worth lying on the ground, literally. Uh, because we could make the site 10 or 20 degrees cooler. And uh, then we found that the cryo pipes were insulated, of course. You can argue about how well they should be insulated. And then they were covered with shiny stainless steel. There's something odd about stainless steel, which I confirmed by doing some infrared measurements. Let's try a little thought experiment. I've got three pieces of sheet metal here sitting in the hot sun. One of them is bright bare metal, another one's painted white, another one's painted black. Which one will get hottest? The black one. Who, blo who votes for black? Who votes for the white one? Who votes for the bare metal? Because stainless steel has terrible infrared emissivity, so it has to get really hot before it can cool off. They would have been better off painting it black, although white paint costs the same. How about an ice cream plant? Sorry to dwell on ice cream. Must be something about the weather. Uh, and I visited one that had best-in-class equipment, but then I noticed that the insulated box containing the pipes that you're trying to make very cold to turn cream into ice cream also contained a couple of 250-horse motors and the compressors they drive. So all the waste heat was going into the same pipes you're trying to make cold. You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what's wrong with that one. We often find choke flow, um, throttling valves, throttling vanes in cube law machines. It's even worse than trying to drive your car with the accelerator floored and just control speed with the brake. Or how about when we're doing a lot of cooling we don't need to do because we didn't design the building properly. And making things the right size is really critical. Normally, fab designers assume the tools are going to use about two to five times the energy they actually use. This is partly because of safety margins and partly because load diversity is ignored. Not everything's running flat out at the same time. Typical duty factor is 30 or 40 percent in many fabs. So this means that the phantom loads we design for that don't actually occur cause us to buy hundreds of extra tons with a whole system cost approaching $2,000 and incur the part load penalties of the oversized system and when we have inflated load estimates, that means deep coils, big pressure drops, oversized fans. The fans end up heating the air as much as the tools do. And then everything else gets bigger as well. So CapEx goes up right across the board because the initial sizing was not done really well. And then there's extra OPEX as well to support those assets. I think Mr. Lee once remarked that if we designed fabs or if we designed jumbo jets, the way we designed chip fabs, they would have four extra sets of landing gear, you know, three are spare just in case, and they'd have two extra sets of engine and so on, and they'd never get off the ground. But of course, in designing a jumbo jet, we do actual measurements of what loads we have to meet because it all has to get up in the air. Now, thinking again about reducing loads, suppose you're cooling a clean room, 
we often find, even nowadays, that the tool displays use cathode ray tubes that were left over from someplace. Well, it's very cheap to buy the, the flat panel display. In fact, it's probably cheaper now than the CRT. And it lasts longer. It doesn't drift. It's more reliable. It's easier to read, so you'll have fewer ergonomic errors. It doesn't weigh much. It has a small footprint. So there's less sizing in the uninterruptible power supply and the HVAC. It gives better laminar flow. It doesn't produce that severe thermal chimney that rises up and disrupts your laminar flow. It doesn't have a static charge attracting dust. It doesn't outgas, compromising the clean room. It's sealed. It doesn't have slots with airflow to gather and stir up dust. And it doesn't have the cathode ray tubes risks of implosion or high voltage or EMI. It seems pretty obvious we ought to get all our CRTs out of the clean room straight away. Here's a more interesting one. How about converting the fluorescent lamps in the clean room to a light pipe feed that filters out the heat before it gets into the cooled space? That reduces the heat by several fold. It doesn't disturb laminar flow or give static or EMI. And you don't have to have people walking into the clean room to replace lamps. And you don't have the risk of breaking lamps and strewing around phosphor and mercury. And you don't have particle shedding every time you turn the lamp on the contacts. There are no ballasts to fail or to outgas. It's easy to reconfigure the tint, like for photoresist or the location. And with indirect light bounced up off the ceiling, you can use five to seven times fewer lux for the same or better visibility. Better light, no flicker, no hum, less fatigue, better visibility, better productivity, fewer mistakes. You get the idea. Lots of multiple benefits from a single expenditure and easy to retrofit. Anything we can get out of the clean room is worth many, many dollars per watt to eliminate, especially in this climate with the cost of drying the makeup air. Now, once you've minimized the flow required in, say, a pumping system, suppose it's a chilled water or processed water system, then we minimize the friction to deliver it. Very often you see a pair of pumps, either helper pumps or ones an in-place spare for a critical pump, they're laid out like this because they're drawn like this. Then they're built like this. So all the time, the flow goes through two right angle bends, extra friction. Then it goes through two valves. Why don't we do it with no bends and no valves or one valve? Well, we're just not used to it. It's different. But Peter Rumsey, a protege of Mr. Lee's colleague of mine, did that as a retrofit and saved three quarters of the energy in this condenser water system. Notice he has not just a Y joint, but a sweet bend with a pipe running diagonally through the air because he correctly instructed the pipe fitter to lay out the supply pipes as if they were drains. Drains, of course, with right angles will clog. Plumbers know that. And he also got rid of 15 pumps that will never again waste electricity and maintenance. Nega pumps are a wonderful kind to have. So the result was on the, on the retrofit of that museum, he ended up saving five-eighths of the annual cost whilst doing very little to one of the pumping systems and only a bit to the cooling towers. After a while, you develop special Muda spectacles. Take a look at this little tank back here and what happens to its pipe run. I figured if that tank had been rotated 30 degrees around its vertical axis, we could have eliminated 11 bends. When you start taking a careful look at process piping layout, it's obvious that whoever designed this stuff was thinking about something else. And perhaps they were paid by the bend. Uh, my, the best example I know is actually from a brilliant engineer at Stone and Webster who was doing a bit of an ethylene plant. And by untangling the layout, he was able to reduce the number of elbows from 29 to 3. And these were half meter diameter stainless elbows. So he was uh, a very happy camper. Here's a common error. I'll bet many of us have designed Piping runs like this to bring, down, bring back water from a cooling tower to a chiller. How about doing it this way? Everything gets better. It just requires thought because it's different than what we're used to doing. 
Big pipes, small pumps, very few bends, sweet bends, wide bends, much less space, weight, friction, energy, fewer parts, less installation, smaller parts, less O&M, higher uptime. Everything gets better. How often can we do that in process piping layouts? Quite often. Air handling, same basic physics as pumps. We're used to emphasizing just fan and motor system efficiency. And to be sure, you can often wring a factor two out of those, but you can get a factor five or 10 additionally out of the flow and the head. For example, you can reduce airflow by basing air change rates on, say, particle counts in the clean room, the way IBM often does, or actual health goals in a chemical works or a hospital, real-time sensors and feedback, in other words. And you can use displacement ventilation, which is enormously more effective and efficient than turbulent uh, induction. And then you can reduce pressure drop, system design, less flow needed, then ring out friction, then use low face velocity. Just going from a 50 to a 60 centimeter duct at a given flow will save 60% of fan power. Well, if you combine all of these, you get really dramatic savings. Factor roughly 2 times 5 or 10 is 10 or 20. And then if your fans are smaller, well, all the fan energy you did was make the air hotter, so now you can make the chiller smaller. Here's a typical lab consumption, uh, which didn't do very well on the lighting, but notice what it did to the ventilation and the cooling without any improvement to the lab equipment and saved 5 eighths of the total energy at lower capex. And a lot of the key to that is the exhaust hoods, similar to those you'd find in Semicon. Um, there are two different approaches to efficient wet cam hoods that save about 70 or 80 percent of the energy and improve safety and cost less to build. They, they both do it by aerodynamics, <clears throat> and hoods often account for half to three quarters of the total energy used by a wet chem lab. You know, one hood is equivalent to many houses in energy use. Then we should use science-based standards for indoor air quality, sensor-based real-time controls. And when we realize what all this stuff costs, we'll start to encourage aqueous systems, non-toxic design, dry cleaning methods, supercritical CO2. And then we'll ask, if we don't want to breathe this stuff, why are we putting it up the stack so our neighbors can breathe it? Why don't we just design it out? If we want to keep people comfortable, which is not the same as keeping a building comfortable, the building has no central nervous system, then we can expand the range of conditions in which people feel comfortable. There are about 10 ways to do that, some indicated by comfort theory, some not. We can minimize unwanted gains of heat into the space from inside or outside. We can cool passively in the ways that have been proven for thousands of years, and they're very effective even in severe climates like yours. And then we can use non-refrigerative cooling we can use desiccant or absorption to handle latent load, combine it with direct indirect evap to get over 100 units of cooling per unit of electricity in a Pennington or Fanziel cycle. We could, of course, do super efficient refrigerative cooling, COP6 for comfort, 6.8 or so for, for process in Singapore, as Mr. Lee normally does. We could do cool storage and controls. We end up saving most of the cooling energy because, say, a factor four or so will go away in methods one and two and a bit more in three and all the rest if we want in four. In fact, we never need to get to method five. But how do we do COP6 in Singapore? Well, here's how Mr. Lee does it. You notice eight or tenfold savings in all the components except the chiller, which only saves 0.010 in Singapore. And then if you are doing process cooling, go to a ch dual chilled water temperature, maybe four and a half degrees for condensing, and then a separately optimized 12 degree coil for sensible cooling. Such a system actually reduces capex, improves performance, and there's no reason we shouldn't be doing it everywhere in Singapore. There is a trick to it. Willis Carrier in 1921 misinterpreted his lab data to be telling him that airflow through a cooling coil was largely turbulent and condensation was in a uniform film.
But Sam Luxton in Adelaide, South Australia, built a wind tunnel and discovered that actually the flow is largely laminar and the condensation is in lots of little droplets. So if you blow the air too fast, like several meters per second, then the droplets smear out into a film and blow away, and you don't get their extended surface area. But if you leave it by using face velocities below a meter per second, then you get 29% better dehumidification per unit of sensible cooling. And a good way to do this is what Mr. Lee calls a low face velocity, high coolant velocity coil. In other words, move the air slowly and the coolant quickly, because it takes enormously less energy to move coolant than to move air, because you want to preserve these drops with low phase velocity. And a good way to do this is to change the normal deep, uh, densely spaced coil, turn it round sideways, blow the same flow of air through the same amount of copper at a quarter of the phase velocity. Again, under a meter per second is good. And then your airside pressure drop will go down by a factor 20. But all the supply fan was doing is heating the air. So whenever you had heated return air, that's an evaporator load. And by eliminating that, you can make the chiller smaller. So the usual parasitic load buildup, the vicious circle that makes everything bigger and costlier, runs backwards as a virtuous circle. Everything gets smaller and cheaper. Savings begin fundamentally with measurement. I remember, oh, let's see, 96, that would be 12 years ago, visiting a couple of hard drive plants. One of them used 54 times more energy per drive than the other one. Guess which one went out of business that year? There was a chip maker with a rated chilled water plant COP in the worst plant, 42% below the best one. It was in a, actually a less difficult climate than Singapore. But only one of them was measuring, uh, was, was actually measuring the COP. The, the rest we just took their word for it. And when they measured it, it was 21% worse than the rated COP. You know, uh, guesses only count in <laughs> horseshoes. Or, uh, you, you really need to measure. And actually, the best COP that they had was 20, over 20% 20 worse than the Singapore state of the art. The owner was losing over a million U.S. dollars a year just by not adopting its own best practices in chiller plant. What's efficiency worth over 20 years? Now, I've assumed here a fairly low tariff, five U.S. cents a kilowatt hour, and made some pretty basic assumptions. And it turned out that on those numbers, if you actually count the filter replacement, it's worth eight or nine U.S. dollars present value to get a watt out of the clean room. That's a lot. That's two or three times what it costs to make a peak watt with photovoltaics. A liter per second of clean room exhaust on these assumptions is worth over $130 US present value. In a climate like yours, just a 25 Pascal pressure drop, which to most engineers would be a rounding error, is worth almost a quarter of a million US dollars present value. Just a 250 Pascal Delta P on makeup or exhaust is worth about two and a half dollars for each liter per second. In a continuously running motor in conditioned space, every percentage point efficiency is worth almost 100 US dollars. If your electric tariff is higher, adjust accordingly. Now, if we go into a design exercise knowing these numbers, we will value efficiency much better than if we don't. I would suggest kind of writing these numbers on your forehead <laughs> so you'll see them every morning when you're shaving. <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, it really does change the way you design when you realize how much efficiency is worth. Let me tell you a little about that Texas Instruments 100,000 square meter fab. The clean room was 20,500 square meters. Paul Westbrook at TI has shared all of this in his Fabscape paper four years ago. And... Um, we did a three-day design charrette uh, 11 months before construction start. It was finished in spring aught six, and by then the, the chip it was supposed to make was off the market, so now it's awaiting facilitization for the next big thing they're going to make. And let me explain why. Hello, Mr. Gates. 
Let me explain why it was built in Texas, not China. And, uh, you know, a friend of mine went to a software usability conference. The lead speaker was from Microsoft. And when he got up to speak, oops, uh, you could see that it's set up on the screen. Sorry, PowerPoint does not recognize this type of PPT file. This was rather puzzling until someone in the audience said, well, you work for Microsoft. I'll bet somebody put the, uh, the beta version of the next PowerPoint on your machine without the filters to translate the old files. He said, oh, darn, yeah, that's what happened. Here, please let me stand down and put up the next speaker, and I'll fix this. So he did. And then he came back again. This time his computer would not handshake with the projector. <laughs> And he said, oh, phooey, uh, look, it'll take too long to reboot. Let me just give my talk without the slides. And someone in the audience said, you don't even need to give your talk. You already gave it twice. <laughs> I hate bad code. So um, when running the design charrette, we had an XTI guy named J.D. Bryant, who was a Texas good old boy, say, we want big honking ideas. And that stands for holy cow, over the top, no nonsense, knock you out. I don't know why I didn't do this before now because it's got to save me a whole bunch of money and time. And we came up with 16 of those in three days, 13 of which saved CapEx, much to their astonishment. And the whole thing was driven by data. They looked at where the energy was going. So they ended up in focusing in the utility plant, of course, on the chillers and the fans, and in the uses, mainly on vacuum pumps and uh, process uh, cooling water in order to reduce the uh, indirect loads. And they designed based on measurements. So their vacuum pumps turned out to be 21% of their measured electrical load. And they figured out with the vendors and Semitech a protocol to signal when the pump isn't working, isn't, when it's idle because tools use about as much energy idling as they do processing wafers, and nearly all of the idle energy can be saved. So their new vacuum pumps that signal when they're idle save as much processed cooling water, or well, save a whole lot, about 30% higher efficiency. They save 300 tons of cooling just on the vacuum pump idle signal. And then they also save nitrogen and altogether about 7% of total electricity. On exhaust, they recover some general exhaust heat, and then they worked with the tool makers to optimize for the right thermal constraints and ended up saving 50 cubic meters a second of both exhaust and makeup air. Think about the cost of conditioning that air. For process cooling water, they designed, as in the building HVAC I suggested, for small pressure drop, close approach heat exchangers, and that reduced their flow by 20%, 190 liters per second less. Their central utilities plant was 21% of their total load, so they split it into a low and a high temperature coil and optimized each chiller in each coil for its duty, a low temperature for condensing, high temperature for sensible. The The high temperature chiller had a steadier load, and it has heat recovery, so they ended up building one boiler and a backup for it, not six boilers, and the boilers hardly ever go on. And then they did humidification with a high-pressure spray, not with steam. So altogether, their NOx emissions in a NOx-critical area went down 60%. Very happy EPA. Then they did variable speed primary distribution, efficient pipes, pumps, variable speed motors, variable speed fans, and they were able to cover the redundancy requirements of both chillers with a single low temperature spare chiller by a blending. They didn't need a spare for each one. On makeup air, they did runaround coils for free reheat. They did low phase velocity, although not as low as I would have expected for their smaller fans. I mentioned the high pressure humidification getting rid of the steam boilers. And they were investigating but had not yet executed enthalpy wheel recovery on the exhaust. That'll, that'll go in their next fab. And a desiccant wheel uh, option that would eliminate the entire low temperature chiller plant. 
in other words, a passive latent heat exchanger from the exhaust to the intake air. That goes in the next plant. Recirc air was 10% of the fab load, and they discovered that they were way over-designing. It was like belt and braces and going about holding up your trousers. So they took full credit for their mini environments and reduced their HEPA coverage from 50% to just 25 or 30 in the fan filter units, and that eliminated 300 tons of cooling right there. Now, because filter life goes as the inverse square of air velocity, they could pay for the extra FFUs in six years, which is a 13% ROI, by reduced filter replacement. And then they were testing different kinds of smocks because the, the workers could be cooler in warmer rooms. And also, because the wafers are already in the pods, they're less concerned about part particles. This has all worked out very well. They also did water efficiency. Uh, over 60% of their total water use was for uh, deionized. So they used the RO reject and some recycling to save 20% of the input. They did their evap and blowdown uh, with uh, wastewater, cutting over 50% by using the first stage brine. Their scrubbers replaced raw water purchase with fairly pure industrial waste that was quite adequate for the task. And altogether, they saved four megaliters a day of input. I think the state of the art on a US fab is 96% water recovery in Intel Albuquerque. They also used water, waterless urinals and um, an 8,000 cubic meter rainwater retention plan and native uh, plantings. And, you know, just, just this one measure was over two megaliters a year. In the admin building and often in the fab, they did passive solar orientation facing the right way, exterior shading. They used energy and daylighting models and found they could save 30,000 U.S. dollars a year just by rotating the building 30 degrees before they built it. No extra cost. Um, they did light shelves, efficient dimming lights, super windows, high reflectance and infrared emissivity roof, and demand-controlled ventilation. It's the same things you do in any good office. Now, compared with their previous best design, which they didn't know how to improve upon, I mentioned already the savings achieved, but what shocked them was the 30% lower capex. It made it cheaper than a Chinese fab. And then, of course, the next one was expected to save more and cost less, and it did. They recently designed it. Now, better optimized tool design was already driving half their savings, and they've been pushing that further. Um, in fact, ultimately, I think we can get over a decade or two to a factor eight or ten better fab by getting really serious about efficient tool design because the tool makers have not been told what it's worth to save a unit of electricity or exhaust or process cooling water. And now that they're starting to figure that out, they see it as a source of competitive advantage to do that design for their users. I think also we'll end up with a heat-driven desiccant to eliminate the low temp chiller, and we'll do on-site tri-generation or poly-generation of electricity, process heat, space heat, cooling. And by the way, how about the economics? This was a silver, lead silver fab, the first one, a, I don't know whether it came out silver or gold admin building. And they paid two or three million dollars for the lead related items, which is a bit like your, uh, your own green standard. But most of that was efficiency they would have bought anyway just to save money. At the old energy prices, they projected three quarters of a million US dollars a year of OPEX saving. The prices then doubled. So they were saving about one and a half million a year uh, at startup and three million and up. Nowadays, more like six million at, at, uh, at the present energy prices when they're at full build out. And the extra net capex of all the efficiency they think was less than zero, and it was certainly less than 1%. Now, the next sort of thing to come at us will be fuel cells, which are ultra reliable on site power. That's why they're used in spacecraft. And you avoid the capex and the losses and the whole football pitch full of batteries requiring maintenance on the uninterruptible power supply. The fuel cell will give you free process cooling and space cooling and 
heating and free ultra pure hot water, which is an extremely valuable output. It can displace a lot of your DI water. It, you also, you're doing on-site hydrogen production for the fuel cell from natural gas, so that replaces costly shipments of hydrogen for process in the tube trucks. And even if you were to retrofit handmade by PhDs on a lab bench fuel cells into a fab, you can make it pencil lab now if you properly cite it and use it in the right way, capture these benefits and what are called distributed benefits of local generation, which you'll find at smallestprofitable.org. Here's a little example of integrating efficiency with on-site generation. This 47-story building in New York, saving only 40% of the energy because we got to it so late, still knocked enough out of the CapEx budget to pay for fuel cells and building integrated photovoltaics, helping recruit premium tenants at premium rents because of the ultra-reliable power. And the whole building came in at exactly average market cost. Or here's a jail to which one and a quarter hectares of photovoltaics were retrofitted over a, a retrofitted white roof, and also the ESCO made the jail more efficient. So on the hot days when the solar cells produce the most power, the jail isn't using much and has the most surplus to sell back at the best price. So a $9 million project would have paid without the $5 million government subsidy because it, its present value benefits were $15 million easily beating the 10% hurdle rate. And that will work even better for any other kind of on-site generation. We actually had a 150,000 square meter office and lab complex in the Midwest with a five and a half US cent tariff for electricity. And we were able to get a one year payback with a micro turbine based poly generation system as a retrofit. And we often forget that saving even a little bit of total cost matters because like any saved overhead, it drops to the bottom line. And often basic energy efficiency will add one percentage point or more to your total net profit. Think about it this way. If selling new chips earns 10% profit, saving $1 worth of energy raises your profits by, by the same amount as selling $10 more of new chips. And it's much harder and less certain to do that than to save energy that's entirely under your control. There's no competition in doing that in your plant. And if you're short of capital in the chip business, please don't waste your capital on oversized and overcomplex utility plant. Now, ST set some interesting goals for CO2. When, when we showed them in 99 how to cut CO2 per chip by 92%, profitably then, and 98% profitably in a few years. They adopted a 90% cut goal for 2000 and zero CO2 by 2010, even though in 2010 they expected to make 40 times the chips they'd make in 1990. And they would achieve this by doing a lot of their supply from fuel cells and combined heat and power, a little from renewables, and their carbon per dollar value added would be less than a fifth what it was in 1990. So they were projecting that by 2010, their carbon reduction would be over 10 megatons and worth at the old energy prices nearly a billion US dollars, along with perfluorocarbon reductions at least tenfold, which was another over 10 megatons equivalent. How do you do these big cuts? Well. Think about it in steps, like links in a chain. Just the 300 millimeter shift for the same yield uh, multiplies your CO2 by 0.44 per, per chip output. State-of-the-art fab efficiency saves another 70%. On-site trigen net of reformer loss, another 60%. Eliminating the UPS losses, another 6%. Fueling with gas, not coal, because it's less carbon intensive, another 50%. Switching to half renewables, another 50%. Multiply it out, those six steps cut your CO2 per chip by 99%. So if you produce 30 times more chips, like 18% a year growth for 20 years, and you fueled your growth in this way, your total CO2 would go down nearly threefold, so you could sell carbon permits to your competitors. Almost all these steps are profitable now, the rest soon, 
and all of them can bring big operational benefits. And I'm not counting stuff further upstream like the four or five-fold savings we can now do on the energy used to make Tchaikovsky silicon. There are obstacles to doing what I've described. We have a very risk-averse culture in Semicom, and understandably so. It's really hard. But why are we only innovating inside the clean room? Why does total quality management stop at the clean room wall and not extend to how we provide chilled water and clean air? Is any fab in the world optimized for its climate? I have yet to see one. There are often kind of tribal behaviors between the process staff and the utility staff. They address each other perhaps in four-letter words. Uh, you know, it's always their fault, and they seldom cooperate properly. Nobody in the system owns energy losses or gets rewarded for reducing them, and there's never a good time to design for efficiency because either business is good, and then you know your pants are on fire and you're trying desperately to get the next fab online to get to market quickly, and you can't think about anything new, so you copy the last set of drawings, or business is bad, our engineers are beached, there's nothing on the drawing board, so we can't really justify the budget of taking the engineers we've already got that aren't doing anything and paying them to think about the next fab or the fab after next, which would be the right time to do it. Well, Paul Westbrook at TI managed very artfully to squeeze through the invisible crack between these two conditions. That's how he got those breakthrough results. And in the cyclic business, I hope some of you will grasp that opportunity. The key data are seldom measured or displayed. There are, there's only a handful of fabs in the world that can or do accurately measure chilled water kilowatts per ton. Most of them don't have a sufficiently long, clear length of main chilled water pipe to do an accurate flow measurement. What this tells us is that doing that measurement was never part of the design intent because we didn't intend to make it better in the next one. That's a pretty serious indictment. And information is cheap and powerful, but it's really viscous. It sticks to the people who've got it. I remember the factory where we saved 30,000 US dollars the first year by labeling the light switches. People didn't want to turn stuff off because they were afraid it, the unlabeled switch might control something important or they might inconvenience someone. Labels are cheap. <clears throat> there was a certain hard drive factory not far from here that saved a large amount of money <clears throat> by properly labeling the idiot gauge where if the needle went from the red zone or from the green zone to the red zone showing pressure drop across the main filter bank it was time to change the filters so we had them label to paste up two little handwritten labels one called cents per drive the other called million dollars profit per year which was a nonlinear function of cents per drive <clears throat> because uh, if you got to certain price points, you jump market share. Very, very lucrative to put the, that information in front of the operator. And it's just amazing how much energy waste you find by measuring goes in as and goes out as an understanding how your plant is really working. But too often we use poor sensors or uncalibrated sensors. The results are utterly worthless. We don't know whether they're the right number or not. There's too much drift, too much inaccuracy. We ought to figure out how much accuracy is worth and then make sure we get it. And few plants are designed to measure what's needed or to present it to the operator real time in effective graphics. I would urge you to look at Mr. Lee's practice in this regard. Uh, the, the mind has hundreds or thousands of times more bandwidth for a color picture, a, a graphical display, than for tables of numbers, which is what too often the operator has on the screen. Graphics are incredibly effective in understanding how a complex system is behaving. And, you know, it's just simple stuff like this. <clears throat> Notice that when you look at how the chillers work in a certain plant over many hours, you find they're always worse, except maybe down here, than the manufacturer's specification. The second and third chillers are cutting in too early because of a control problem. Oh, and by the way, the maximum load is never above 1,500 tons, so you save a million dollars you thought you needed to spend on a fourth chiller. But you don't. You have plenty. The load isn't that big. To get the value you want out of a fab or another process plant, you have to specify the physical performance you want at a system and subsystem level. Reward the savings you get. 
Only reward them when they're measured clearly. Reward your designers for what they save, not what they spend. This is called performance-based design fees, and it's very effective. And especially <clears throat> back at the front end of your design process, reward your tool makers for system value. If you don't ask them to save watts and exhaust and cooling water and so on and tell them what it's worth to you to save those, you won't get it. They'll just design what they first thought of. Is our next fab going to save half the energy, two-thirds like one we just did, 80%? How much less will it cost to build, 50% like one we just did, more? Well, let's go find out. And more broadly, if you look across the entire range of industry, I don't think there's any limit in sight for a very long time to how efficient we can get. Industry is a materials processing activity. I mentioned that 99.98% of our materials are wasted. Either they never get into durable products, or after they do, they don't recreate value. They're just thrown away. And as we dematerialize, that is, we make more artifacts with less stuff and better design, and we virtualize, and we make things last longer and close the materials loops and do integration between plants that can use each other's waste to create value, and then ultimately we'll get to desktop manufacturing. Most of that waste is going away. There is, of course, a lot of conventional innovation continuing with better technologies. There are important new kinds of processes like microfluidics, you know, in a t typical chemical works, most of your effort is, is not to do the basic reaction, but to separate the product you want from all the unwanted side products that came from side reactions occurring when the conditions of the reaction were not perfectly controlled. So in microfluidics, you have a stack of a bunch of typically silicon wafers with millimeter scale channels etched into them and little reaction chambers where you can very precisely control the mixing, temperature, pressure, and time catalysis, so you get only the reaction you want. The side products aren't made in the first place, so you don't need to separate them. And you can often reduce the size and cost of that plant by orders of magnitude along with its energy use. Efficiency, of course, keeps getting bigger and cheaper through better technology, but the tunneling through the cost barrier through integrative design is the really <clears throat> big key we've got now. But next coming at us are two further design revolutions. One is innovation inspired by nature. Please read Janine Benius' book, Biomimicry. It will just blow your minds about how nature has already solved your design problem. You just need to know which organisms to ask how they did it. And maybe nanotechnology in Eric Drexler's sense of self-assembling molecules at a molecular scale. Although I would add a word of caution about both of these. Nanomaterials are turning out as expected to be rather biologically risky, and biomimicry is not the same as biotechnology. It's really the opposite. You know, biotechnology will take a spider gene and put it into a goat where it doesn't belong so that the goat's milk will contain spider silk that you can then extract and make into things. Biomimicry will figure out how the spider makes the silk, the stuff that's tougher than Kevlar, stronger than steel, and it's made in ambient temperature and pressure under life-friendly conditions in the spider's belly out of digested crickets and flies, and then will imitate how the spider does that. That's biomimicry, very different. And over time, I think you'll find Darwin always beats Descartes. And then there are the options we haven't thought of yet. So if we get good at responsibly combining a large forebrain with opposable thumbs, you know, this zany evolutionary experiment we're engaged in, maybe we'll be around long enough to think of still more good ideas, but we certainly have plenty for now to be getting on with. We're the people we've been waiting for, and companies that capture the opportunities I've described for elegant frugality will flourish Companies that don't, as the chairman of DuPont at Willard remarked, won't be a problem because ultimately they won't be around. And big discoveries are protected by public incredulity. So if you're incredulous, I could understand why, but uh, perhaps not all your, in your competitors are so inhibited.
Thank you very much.